Hello and welcome to Energy 154 Unit 5. In this unit we'll be discussing geothermal, hydropower, wave, and tidal power. So the first thing we want to discuss is geothermal. And as usual, one of your homework questions will be to calculate the percentage that geothermal provides the total United States energy supply. So let's first talk about what the source of geothermal power is. So, as we've all probably learned, the inner core of the Earth is much hotter than the crust, or even the mantle. And really what drives this is radioactive decay, which is heating the Earth's core, and also pressure. But radioactive decay is the sustainable extraction that we could get from the Earth's core. So that's what's really driving it. It's the heat from radioactive decay of elements in the Earth's core. That's the source of our geothermal power. So how do we extract that heat and use it? So it actually works just like we've been talking about before, how we make, we take heat, we make steam, we run a turbine, which runs a generator, which powers a load. But in this case, the heat comes from deep within the earth. And so what we do is there's something called an injection well, where we inject water into the earth. And it goes far below the earth, and it heats up and it comes back up through a production well as steam. And then the steam um, basically heats up the, the water in this cycle and creates more steam to drive this turbine. And the turbine drives the generator. So it's a little more complicated than this, but that's the general idea. We're just using the heat from the earth to drive a turbine, to make steam and drive this turbine. So the same general idea as fossil fuels, except the heat's coming from the earth instead of from fossil fuels burning. So one common misconception with geothermal is that there's something called a geothermal heat pump. So a geothermal heat pump is a way to save energy, but is not an energy producer. So let me explain what a geothermal heat pump is and why it's not a power or energy producer. So what a geothermal heat pump does is it uses the ground as a heat sink or heat source. So let me sort of explain that. So let's say we're running our air conditioner, so we're cooling. So if we, um, in a heat pump, what happens is when we're cooling, is we're taking heat from our house and rejecting it to outside. So normally this is done just to the outside air, and that's what you'll, you'll see if there's a fan running outside your house in the air conditioner. That's where we're rejecting the heat, to the outside air. But it's hard to reject heat when it's 95 or 100 degrees outside. It's much easier to reject heat when it's a constant temperature. And that's what the ground is. The ground is a constant temperature, usually somewhere between 50 and 60 degrees in this area, all year round. So what we do is instead of rejecting the heat to the air, we go ahead and reject our heat. So here's our heat coming from our house. We reject our heat and put it into the ground. And that in turn cools off our refrigerant that's flowing through here. So don't worry too much about that. But So it cools this off and the cold goes back into our house. So that's the basic idea is that in when we're in cooling season is the excess heat, instead of accessing it into the air, we put it into the ground. And with heating, we do the exact opposite. We put the cold from the house into the ground and take the heat back in. So that's the only the basic idea is we're moving heat around with this heat pump. And it's easier to move heat around when you have a 50 or 60 degree thing, rather if you have a zero degree or 100 degree um, thing, which would, the air would be if you were doing it to the straight outside air. So that's the idea. So what's the resource for geothermal power? Now that we know that geothermal heat pumps aren't part of geothermal power, what's the geothermal resource? So it's a little hard to quantify, so this is what uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab has said. It just goes from a most favorable to a least favorable scale. And then there's also some not applicable things. So we can see that the most favorable spots are more towards the west coast. And so these are, and then the dots are identified hydrothermal sites, which just basically means they're already identified as being very hot sites that we could use. So that's the idea. So these are these are the hotter sites over here. So there are lots of um, places that are most favorable on the west coast. On the east coast, you'll see 
it's not nearly as favorable for geothermal power. So also what I want to mention is that if when you're doing your homework, for sites that are favorable, you can assume there is an average of 17 milliwatts per meter squared, and this comes from the textbook, of geothermal energy. So for each meter squared of land you have, you can get 17 milliwatts from it. All right, so now that we covered geothermal, I want to switch to, co to cover hydropower. So again, how we want to start this is we want to figure out for homework what the percentage of hydropower is to the total United States energy supply. And just like we do with geothermal, let's talk about what the source of hydroelectric power is. So this is a um, hydroelectric dam that takes water, takes water and makes electricity. And so what it's really doing is it's taking um, high water from the reservoir that's behind the dam and letting it fall and taking the energy from that. So the idea behind it is that falling water turns a turbine. You can think about this. You can, you've probably seen a water wheel before, at least a picture of one. It's the same general idea, but instead of turning a water wheel, we're turning a turbine, and that turbine is making electricity with a generator. So let's, let's try to quantify the energy in falling water. So really, the energy in falling water is just gravitational potential energy. So whenever we lift something up, we're giving it some potential energy because if we lift it up, it's, it's gaining energy because it's gaining height. And when we drop it, it's losing energy because it's, and it's gaining speed as it falls to the ground. So a real simple formula for potential energy is that potential energy equals the mass of an object times the gravitational constant times its height above the ground. So it makes sense that the more mass of an object and the higher it goes, the more potential energy you have. And I gave you the units here. The potential energy is in joules. The mass is in kilograms. G is the Earth's gravitational constant, and that's 10 meters per second squared. Sometimes people do 9.8, but 10 is fine for this class. And H is the height in meters. We also want to note that water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and that 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules equals 1 kilowatt hour. Okay? So what we're going to do is do a little sample problem, and we're going to use the above and calculate um, how much water energy in kilowatt hours is there in one meter cubed of water that is one kilometer in the air? So just imagine a meter cubed. So if you take a meter stick, and that's a side of a cube, and then you lift that one kilometer in the air. And one kilometer is about half a mile. It's a little more than half a mile. Okay? So that's the idea. So if we took that, let's do a little calculations. So we have one meter cubed, and we want to convert that um, to kilograms. And I gave you the unit conversion that 1,000 kilograms um, is in one meter cubed of water. And then so this is our M right here, because this is in kilograms once we multiply there. Then we multiply by G. And then we multiply by the height. But the height has to be in meters, so we convert the kilometers into meters here. And then remember that when we get M, G, H, that equals joules. So this equals 1 times 10 to the 7th joules. And 1 times 10 to the 7 joules, we want to convert to kilowatt hours. And I gave you the unit conversion for that. That's 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules equals 1 kilowatt hour. And there is how many kilowatt hours you get. So this is how many kilowatt hours you get if you have one meter cubed of water raised one kilometer in the air. So let's look at sort of the potential that different areas of the United States have for hydroelectric power. So the first thing we really want is we want a lot of water falling. So we want a lot of water to fall in, in our area if we're, if we're a state that wants to do a lot of hydropower. Because a lot of water means the M is going to be bigger. Okay, so let's first look at how to make the M big. So this is a graph of the average annual precipitation in the United States. So it's a, it's a pretty um, telling graph and so, sort of intuitive from what we know about the United States is that the East Coast is pretty wet and there's lots of places in the West Coast that are pretty dry. 
okay? But also we have this really Pacific West Coast that gets a lot of rain. And we know that Washington and Oregon on the West Coast are, we, all, we really know Seattle as the rainy city. And we can see that on this map, okay? So, so that's really concentrated here is where there's lots of rain. Okay, so now let's also look, we know the M there, so this is the map that gives us the M. So let's look at the H, okay? So this is an elevation map, so we can see a couple different things on this map. We obviously know that the coastal areas are pretty low, and then we know that there's mountain ranges, so this is the Appalachian mountain range, and there's also the Rocky mountain range. So the Rockies we know are much higher. So this is the H. So we want basically there to be places where it's really rainy, but it's also really high. Because remember, M times G times H equals the hydroelectric power. Okay? So what I want you to do for homework is from these two maps to, taken together, where would you expect to be the most hydroelectric power and why? So think about that for a little bit and answer that homework question. So I want to do a little practice problem also with this. If we look at these two maps, we get this, um, these two figures. The first figure is the average annual USA rainfall is 29 inches, or 742 millimeters. And so we're going to use the rainfall numbers, those rainfall numbers, and I want to say that the average elevation in the United States is 542 meters. And its area is 9.6 times 12, 10 to the 12 meters squared. So using all that data, what's the maximum amount of energy that could be produced by hydroelectric power in the USA over one year? And for this, we're also going to assume that we can capture all that power. So we're going to say 100% efficiency. So I also want to give you the idea is that one quad equals 1.055 times 10 to the 18th joules. So let's look at the solution here. So the first thing we want to do is we know this is the amount of rainfall that falls over this area. So that's how many cubic meters of water falls over the United States in one year. So again, we're going to convert that to kilograms using our equation. So this is the M right here. The first two terms give us the M in our mass, MGH. And here's our G. And then I gave you the average height is 542 meters. So getting those, doing those calculations, we get 38.6 times 10 to the 18th joules. And then I gave you the unit conversion that one quad equals 1.055 times 10 to the 18th joules. Doing that, all that calculation out gives about 35.5 quads of hydroelectric energy over the United States. So that's the, if we captured all the falling um, water in the United States, we would get that much energy. So I showed you a picture of a big dam before, and I wanted just to wrap up this unit showing you that there's not necessarily, the big dam doesn't have to be the picture that we see. We can also, what's called microhydro, which is we divert a stream which, with an intake diversion, and we, get a, we have a screen on it so that way particles don't flow, and we put a pipe down there called a penstock, and that runs into our powerhouse with our turbine, that we turn the turbine with that water, and then it just comes back into the stream. So this is done a lot in some rural areas um, just for a little bit of power instead of the big central dams that we're used to. So I just want to make you aware of that to wrap up our hydro unit. Okay, so now that we're done with hydropower, I want to talk a little bit about wave power. So wave power, um, the source of wave power is really waves, obviously, but the idea is that you can move something up with the wave that coming coming through. Think about if you're in the ocean and you're bobbing up and down. Well, really, you have some energy. Every time you go up, you're gaining gravitational potential energy. And then if you fall back down, you can lose that energy. If we're able to capture that up and down motion, the power of that, that's the source of the wave power. So instead of me explaining sort of how a couple of these things work, I want to show you two videos. And here are the links to the videos, but I'll go ahead and pull them up and, and let you show, let you watch them. The water of the oceans of the world is almost always in motion. Hardly ever interrupted, waves break at the coastlines, sometimes strong, sometimes weaker. 
there is an enormous energy potential that is available round the clock and free of charge. A potential that if fully exploited could satisfy 40% of the worldwide demand for power. This equals the output of 700 to 800 nuclear power stations. Foyt Hydro WaveGen is developing technologies to convert this inexhaustible energy into electric power without the emission of harmful greenhouse gases. The operating principle of this wave power station is as simple as it is ingenious. An enclosed chamber has an opening beneath sea level which allows water to flow from the sea to the chamber and back. The water level in the chamber rises and falls with the rhythm of the waves and air is forced forwards and backwards through the turbine connected to an upper opening in the chamber. As it is compressed and decompressed, the airflow has sufficient power to drive the Wells turbine. It is a feature of the Wells turbine, named after its inventor, that it is driven in the same direction by both forward and reverse airflow through the turbine. Even relatively low wave motions can generate enough airflow to keep the turbine moving and to generate energy. This is how easily energy can be generated with a wave power station, day and night, all year round, as long as there are waves. The world's first power station of this kind was put in service as early as November 2000 on the Scottish island of Isla and has been feeding power to the grid ever since. Foyt Hydro WaveGen is convinced of the commercial potential of wave energy. We are certain that our wave power stations can make a significant contribution to supplying the world with climate-friendly energy. Okay, I don't need to submit you to that announcer. So we'll we'll see some. We'll put to test some of his uh, assumptions throughout your homework. You'll see how much potential that wave power can have. So I want you to show you another thing. The second video. So let me bring that up. So that's the idea. Instead of having the, something on the shore, you have something floating out in the ocean, as you could see from that. Okay, so now we sort of have an idea of how wave power can work. Let's look at the potential. So wave energy potential is actually pretty easy to calculate um, if, we get, if we use one big assumption. And that assumption that the author uses in our textbook is that Atlantic waves have on average about 40 kilowatts per meter in them. And so we're going to guess for the purpose of this course that Pacific waves probably have a bit higher just because the Pacific waves in the Pacific Ocean are bigger. And we're going to guess 50 kilowatts per meter. Now this is a guess, but this is good enough for this course. Okay. So once you have this to calculate the, the potential, you just multiply by the coastline length. So let's, let's do this sample problem for the United States. So if the U.S. has a coastline of 19,924 kilometers, we're going to assume a wave production of 45 kilowatts per meter. So that's halfway in between the Atlantic and the Pacific numbers we just said we'd assume. And we're also going to say that a wave generator has an efficiency of 50%.
So if we covered the whole coastline of the United States how many, with wave machines, how many quads would we generate per year? So let's look at that. So again, we start off with the 45 kilowatts per meter. We know how many kilometers there are. We also want to convert that, that kilometer to meters with the 1,000 meters per kilometer. And then we end up with 45 kilowatts. We also want to multiply by how many hours per year, and we'll get kilowatt hours per year. But then we want to convert to quads. So we get the unit conversion between BTUs and kilowatt hours, and then the unit conversion with quads and BTUs. So this turns out to be you get 26.8 quads in one year. Okay, So that's not the whole United States potential, because the United States uses about 97 quads per year. That's a good percentage. And just think about what, what would happen if we, we um, were to capture all that energy. So I want to talk to you a little bit about tidal power now. It turns out tidal power is pretty complicated, so I'm not going to require that you calculate how much tidal power your state gets. But I want to give you a little introduction to tidal power anyway. So what we see here is a sort of an animation of the tides. The pink sort of um, bubble around the earth is the water in the oceans or the bays or whatnot. And so we can see as the moon moves around the earth, it draws tides to different locations. And so basically the tides are caused by the moon. There's also tides less, lesser, in the lesser um, whatnot caused by the sun. So that's why um, tides can sometimes be a little different because it's how the solar and lunar tides coexist together. So just like I did before, I want to show you a video of how tidal power really works. So let me bring that up. So this video doesn't have any audio, so I'll take you through it a little bit. As the tide's coming in, there's water moving through turbines. So again, now we're just something moving, and we're driving turbines, which drive generators, which make electricity. And as the tide flows out, the turbines just spin in the opposite way. So that's the idea, is that it's just spinning turbines that generates electricity. So you can see lots of uh, generation technologies are the same sort of thing, is that there's just spinning turbines that create electricity. It's just how we spin those turbines that's different. So tidal power is no, not much different than other types of power, except we're spinning the turbines with the energy in the tides instead of the energy in the wind or energy in the steam from burning fossil fuels or whatnot. So that's a quite simple video. So I just wanted to give you a little overview of tidal power, but with all of these things, I want you to think about the implications. With hydro, with both hydro, tidal, and wave power, we're, all, we're producing energy from moving water. So what if we captured all that energy and used it instead to generate electricity? For the discussion board, I want you to think about what would the implications to the society be if we did that? And I really want you to explain your reasoning for that. So that's the end of Unit 5, and I hope you enjoyed it.